when we think about managing change, that's the context we're talking about is really much more around leveraging. The analogy I wanted to give you um, around dealing with differences, period, and why they're important is imagine you're in a brand new couple, okay? Just started dating someone, you're in a brand new couple, and everything about them, of course, is wonderful, and everything is in common, and you all like the same things, right? What stage are we in? Honeymoon. <laughs> Does it last forever? No. No. However, to become a high-performing couple, what do you have to do? You have to learn how to manage your differences. If you ever hear couples say, we never fight, that means danger, danger. Because then you're thinking about, think about group think. If you have Irving Janis talks about group level phenomena, when groups all agree very quickly, and they've made some major, major problems. He studied the escalation of the Vietnam War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Again, danger, danger. You want conflict, you want different perceptions, you want different beliefs, and you want dialogue so they become functional rather than dysfunctional. You know, I always compare, so back to the couple analogy, they need to learn how to manage their differences. You know, one of them wants to go out, one of them doesn't, one of them wants to see friends, one of them doesn't. Same thing in teams. The differences have to get out on the table. You know, that old model that actually has empirical support for groups, Tuckman, groups have to form, then they have to storm. They're not gonna become high performing until they learn to manage their differences. So what we're talking about here is how to manage the differences. That's the difference, here's the difference between functional and dysfunctional, management of differences. Functional is, you know honey, you're getting a little steamed up, I'm getting a little tense, why don't we take an hour, take a break and come back and talk. Functional or dysfunctional? Well, you'll hear the other one, then you'll know. The other one is, I'm not talking about this with you anymore, slam the door and get in the car and drive off. That's the functional one, right? No. no. So the idea is that you keep that connection and you keep that dialogue. But once you go to your amygdala, you know, in the second one, you're in that amygdala part of your brain where we're not at our best, that's when you want to take a break. In the negotiation literature, they say you go to the balcony. So that's when you want to take that break. What you want to do is get to people's interests. What do they care about? What's important to them when you're in the context of change and bringing groups together? One last thing with a couple. When the couple gets to know each other, they learn each other's history, who they've dated, what the conflicts were, what the challenges were, what their strengths are. When I see teams getting brought together, whether it's an alignment, it's a merger, sometimes people don't attend to that. Okay, we're sucking you up over in that, you know, these two groups are merging, but we're acquiring use. Here's the example. Um, a big bureaucratic organization that's kind of slow moving that I've consulted to says, hey, we better get a fast moving high tech company that can help us with our processes. So they acquire them, right? So they acquire them and when they acquire them, they're not getting what they want from them. Why? Well, because they've made them slow down, do things bureaucratically and make them do things their way. Get the analogy to a couple yet? You get someone who's really different from you because it's really attractive and then you spend half your life, I know this is not just me, you spend half your life trying to make them like you, right? The idea is no, celebrate the differences, get them up there and learn how to manage them. So the first thing I want to do is define for you the difference between change and transition because I think this is one of the most important contributions to the research that a guy by the name of William Bridges has done in his book Managing Transitions. Change is the external event, we're going to do a realignment. Um, I'm going to get married, uh, I'm going to move houses, um, I'm going to merge these two teams. That's the external change. But the transition is quite different. The transition is that personal psychological process that people go through to adapt to the change. So it, for example, when I studied bank mergers, the very senior people would say, why are people still using, let's say, Chevy Chase when we're capital now? <clears throat> why are they still using that name? Well, you've known about the change and you've gone through the transition process a year before they have. They're just starting it, they're in a different place. So if you want them to move faster, you need to help them navigate. New beginnings is not when the full change has occurred. It's when you've adjusted to the full change. So while I moved into a new house today, I'm not in new beginnings, I'm still in neutral zone. 
But when I get used to sleeping there and I've made friends and I know my way on the roads probably six months later, now I am in the new beginnings. So if you have a brand new team with different people, and it's brand new if one person changes, because it always goes to the lowest common denominator and you have to reform. If you have a brand new team, you're not yet in new beginnings. Once the team, people really feel like this is my team, then you're there. Mm -hmm.